John Hope Bryan. We're so honored to have you. you. You come straight out of Compton, California, yeah. Los Angeles. Tell us about your upbringing. How did you first get into financial services? Well, my mother and dad divorced over money. We owned, uh, in South Central LA, we owned a eight unit apartment building that we bought for $18,000. Uh, the payment was $237. But they were property owners. Yeah, yeah. We own our own home also, but we own an eight unit apartment building across the street from our house. Uh, you can make the mortgage with one with uh, two rental payments, and we lived in the third unit, so we had five other units that were profit. Anyway, we lost that building is the point. Uh, we had our own home. We lost that. We owned uh, a cement contracting business. We owned a gas station at Normandy and Vernon. For anybody who knows South Central LA, we lost that because my dad could make it but couldn't keep it. He knew how to make money but didn't know how to build wealth. He confused cash flow and profit with wealth building and ownership. That story is so not only enduring and powerful, where you learned things at an early age, saw things at an early age, prepared you and propelled you to what you're doing today. It, it is important to tell our story and for people to understand that rainbows only follow storms. That you, you, you cannot have a rainbow without a storm first. So they know they can do it too. It's deeper than even what I articulated because my grandmother lived in a shotgun shack uh, my great-grandmother was a slave, but my grandfather was a slave. My grandfather, not great-great-great-grandfather, born in 1871, R.B. Smith, Mississippi. Mississippi, that's right. And in 1871, Mississippi, 1871, you were born into effective slavery because it ended in 1865. He was able to get a little farm as a sharecropper. We hear about this in the history books, as a sharecropper. That farm was worth $700 at its height in 1921. So he owned one farm worth $700. My mother ended up owning seven homes. I ended up owning 700 homes through the Promise Homes Company. This is, the, this is the, the march toward freedom. This is the new march of civil rights that I call civil rights for the movement coming from the streets to the suites. And the new color, as it has always been, I believe, is green, but we, don't, we, don't, we were never taught that lesson. And when the rules are published in the playing field's level, as you know, and as you fought your whole life, we succeed. You know, John, I, I, in my younger years, I actually had the opportunity to work with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And of course, before Dr. King was assassinated in 1968, he was heading toward uh, this struggle for economic justice, for economic equity. Uh, but, you know, his life was cut short. Yes, because so, of it, I think. Oh, no question about it. So tell us about Operation Hope. What, what led to you founding this tremendous organization now that has helped so many people across America? Because of him and because of Andrew Young, who was with him. who was on that balcony when Dr. King was assassinated in 68. Yes, in Memphis. In Memphis, April 68. And because of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, who, by the way, also owned $6 million worth of real estate in, eight, in uh, 1865. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. And that real estate is in Baltimore, Maryland. It has a marker on it. Yes. So he rented it out to working class blacks. So he was also financially free. All money is his freedom. But though Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass had the Freedmen's Bank, Lincoln was assassinated eight, April 1865. Dr. King had the Poor People's Campaign. He was assassinated April 1968. I want to extend and continue and hopefully finish successfully some of the work they began. But all this comes back, again, as you know, to personal stories. So I go to a classroom that teaches financial literacy. A banker came to the, cl came to the classroom, blue suit. This is in California? In Compton. Blue suit, white shirt, red tie. He's 6'2", he's Caucasian, male, teaching financial literacy because of the CRA law, banking CRA law just passed in 77. So Dr. Chavis, uh, the second session of this financial literacy lesson, I raised my hand. Excuse me, sir, what do you do for a living and how'd you get rich legally? I was dead serious. <laughs> Nobody in my neighborhood had a business card, was on a salary, could come to my office and to my school in the middle of the day. My mother had an hourly job with two breaks and lunch. <laughs> now, most schools don't teach financial literacy. That's exactly the point I'm making. So he, uh, he says, young man, I'm a banker and I finance entrepreneurs. I said, sir, I don't know what an entrepreneur is. No one's ever mentioned that word to me in my entire life. French word, build something out of nothing. But whatever it is, if it's legal and you're financing it, I'm going to be one. 
that is who I am today. So I understand that you have a 30-year relationship with Wells Fargo. Yeah. How is that possible? Relationships, like everything else. I mean, is it the same way how you and I got here, relationship capital. Uh, I knew, uh, well, in 1982, I was uh, 26 years old. And uh, Wells Fargo was the first bank to give me an account when I was, I think, uh, 18, I mean, a credit account. And I remember the branch I used to walk into on Pico Boulevard across from a mall. And they would give me a little respect and say my name, and that made me feel good. And um, so years later, when I met the regional president, her name was Lynn Pike, and we had a rapport. Uh, when the riots happened, I called her. And I said, we have got to make free enterprise work for the least of these God's children. We've got to give, bring Wall Street down to Main Street, because this riot is really about economics. A billion dollars of property damage, but not one was a home. You don't burn that, which is your own. And she got it instantly. And well, she, Los Angeles, you know, went through a succession of riots, first in the 1960s. Six, the watch and riots. Then, and, and then the Rodney King, uh, in right. the wake of Rodney King. That's right. And so uh, they were the first major financial institution to write a check to a very young man who had a very big idea. I literally said I was going to eradicate poverty in my lifetime. And by the way, today we have a four, we're one of 7% of nonprofits today that have a four star charity navigator rating, which is like a Dun and Bradstreet rating on Wall Street. Essentially, it means that 89 cents of every dollar that comes in goes to the community. So, very little of that money actually goes to administration, even to this day. I know people are scrambling to go look it up, but I want you to tell everybody what is the mission of Operation Hope? Eradicate poverty as we know it in our lifetime, make free enterprise work for the poor, become America's financial coach, uh, to become uh, uh, to change the banking system, to get the banks out of the no business and back into the yes business by moving credit scores 54 points in six months, which is what we do, and 120 points in 24 months, which is what we do, because nothing changes your life more than God or love than moving your credit score 120 points. You have proven examples that you can do that. Oh, we have 4 million clients, and we've directed $4 billion since that check that Wells Fargo gave us to start. Uh, now we have a $50 million annual budget, and uh, uh, $4 billion we've invested in these neighborhoods. We have 200 operating locations. We're the largest in the country in 46 states with 350 full-time staff people uh, that are making free enterprise work every day and finishing, I think, the work of the Freedmen's Bank. So listen, let me just, again, um, pause uh, so that we can uh, digest what you're saying. Starting out as a nine or ten year old brother in Compton, South Central Los Angeles. Today, you're in charge of the largest financial wellness nonprofit in America. That's quite a journey. I just wanted to prove it could be done. I, I, PhDs are good, PhDs are better. <laughs> I want folks to know it's possible. I want to give them a roadmap of how to get there. And I want them to understand that you can do it legally, properly, pay your taxes. <laughs> By the way, we shouldn't be mad about paying taxes. That means you're making money. Pay your taxes, build wealth, not just make money, access the free enterprise system, access the banks, make them say yes to you. How are people responding uh, to all the opportunities that Operation Hope offers? So when I'm in a, a go through the airport, as I did coming to see you, I have TSA agents screaming out their credit score to me. I walk in, 680, 700. I people literally put, giving their phones to me. Uh, I'm like, whoa, whoa, what was that? They're just showing me their credit score. It's great. It, 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 it warms my heart. They're saying to me, I have access now. I have access now. Do you know that half of us African Americans have a credit score below 620? Take away, forget, forget about police brutality for a minute. Forget about racism and all the other legitimate issues. That means that half of us, Dr. Chavis, are locked out of the free enterprise system. I don't, you can go to church every Sunday, be the nicest person on the planet, pay your taxes, be kind, be joyful, and you can't get a decent mortgage at less than 680. Because of your credit score. Because of your credit score. You can't get a small business loan. I don't care how good your idea is. So I love that Wells Fargo was in my neighborhood. I love that the banker created a relationship with me and saw me as a human being. I love that this person, Lynn Pike, and then later on other bankers within Wells Fargo acknowledged that I was somebody. And early on in my movement at Opera Show, when everybody else was sort of 
rolling their eyes or dismissing me, Wells Fargo took me seriously. They would write, I remember a vice chairman of Wells Fargo co-opted an op-ed with me and wrote letters to the federal regulators. You know, you know what that did to my self-esteem as a 26 or 28 year old young man? So everybody makes mistakes, but they're not a mistake. That's a good institution. I can remind everybody that uh, the NAACP was created by blacks and whites. That's just right. <laughs> the Urban League was created by blacks and whites. Operation Hope was founded by a black man with the support of whites who mean well. We all need each other, all of us, because the color of currency is green. John Hope, Brian, what gives you your greatest hope? So what gives me so much hope are conversations like this, where we come from different places but end up in the same spot. Yes. And... And, and I think we're better together. And if you can get 5% of leaders, 5% of banks like Wells Fargo and others, 5% of corporations, 5% of civic leaders, just go to, or more, to mobilize 5% of legislators around a new vision for America, you change the world. So all hope is not lost. All hope is in our hands. Very good. John Hope, Brian, thank you. Honored.